Hello. Hello. I'm Dr. Abbott. I'd like to examine the nerves around your face and head. Would that be okay with you? Yes, of course. At this point, I'm making observations of the patients to see if I can see any abnormality in the cranial nerve distribution. This might be something like ptosis, strabismus, lack of facial expression, salivation, muscle wasting, or facial asymmetry. The first cranial nerve is the olfactory, which is responsible for the sense of smell. Have you noticed any problems with your sense of smell? No. If a patient complains of anosmia or taste abnormalities, these can be explored using a smell testing kit. The optic nerve is the second cranial nerve. The tested components are visual acuity, visual fields and fundoscopy using the ophthalmoscope. I will test visual acuity first. If the patient wears spectacles, then testing is done with the patient wearing them in order to correct any refractive errors. I'd like to test your visual acuity. Um, can you tell me whether you wear spectacles, please? Uh, no. No. Okay, I'd like you to read some print off here. Could you take that in your hand and cover up your right eye, please? Could you read the top line? He moved forward a few steps. The house was so dark behind him, the world so dim and uncertain in front of him. Okay. Could you swap eyes and hands now, please? Then he heard a, a, a sniff, felt something warm against his leg. He had almost stepped upon the animal. He bent down and stroked its wet coat. Okay, that's great, thank you. I've just used a specialist chart which is likely to be available in a special clinic. If you're doing the testing at the bedside, then something like a magazine or a book would suffice. If you do find an abnormality of visual acuity, then you may choose to use a Snellen chart in order to quantify the defect further. I'm going to test your visual fields. Could you cover your right eye with your right hand, please? Now, I'd like you to look and concentrate in the center of my eye. And I'm going to bring my finger in, and when the finger moves, I'd like you to say yes. 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 When I'm doing this, I'm comparing the yes. patient's visual field with my own. Yes. Okay. Could you swap eyes now, please? Yes. 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 If an abnormality is detected, a formal visual assessment by perimetry or central field assessment could be organized. For fundoscopy, it's best to dim the lights in order to allow the pupil to dilate and to ask the patient not to look directly at the beam so that the eye stays in a fixed position. I'd like to examine the back of your eye using the ophthalmoscope. What I'd like you to do, please, is to look behind me at the clock and focus on the clock and not look straight at the light. Please notice for doing this, I'm using the ophthalmoscope for examining the patient's right eye in my right hand and I'm going to look into his right eye through my right eye. First of all, I'm going to examine the red reflex. I'm now going to move closer to examine the back of the eye. I'm looking at the optic disc, I'm looking at the vessels, and I'm now going to scan the rest of the retina. I'm now going to move to look in the left eye. I'm going to swap the ophthalmoscope into my left hand and I'm going to examine the patient with my left eye looking at his left eye. Again, if you could look into the distance, please. Again, check the red reflex and then examine the back of the eye. The cranial nerves 3, 4 and 6 are usually examined together. The tested components are the ocular movements and the pupillary reactions. First I look at the ocular movements. I check at the normal resting position of the eyes and then at the full range of movement. Right, I'm going to test the movement of your eyes now, please. 
What I'd like to do is get you to focus on the tip of my pen. I'd like you to follow with your eyes and keep your head still. I'd also like you to tell me if you see double at any position. Right. Okay. So if you could just follow my pen. I'm taking the patient's eye movements to the extremes of horizontal gaze first. And then examining vertical gaze. At all stages, I'm looking to see if there's any nystagmus in any particular position. I'm now going to test for the movements of the oblique muscles. Okay, so you didn't see double in any of those positions? No. Looking at the individual nerves in turn, the abducens innervates the lateral rectus muscles, which are responsible for abduction of the eye. When the patient has a left sixth nerve palsy, the lateral rectus muscle will malfunction. When the patient looks horizontally to the left side, the left eye will not abduct normally. The patient will complain of double vision and the images will be horizontally displaced. The trochlear nerve innervates the superior oblique muscle and its action is demonstrated by asking the patient to look downwards and inwards. With a left fourth nerve palsy, there will be a weakness of the left superior oblique. When the patient looks downwards and inwards, they will complain of double vision with oblique displacement of the images. Because the double vision occurs on looking towards the right, the patient tends to feel that there is a problem with the right eye rather than the left. All of the other eye movements involve the ocular motor nerve. This nerve also innervates levator palpebris superioris, where weakness will result in ptosis. In the full picture of a third nerve palsy, the pupil will be dilated and the eye will deviate downwards and outwards. Can you follow the pen again, please? As the eyes converge, both pupils are seen to constrict. The light reflex involves the perception of light by the afferent fibers of the optic nerve, with the efferent parasympathetic fibers carried by the third nerve. Now I'm going to shine a light into your eyes. I'd like you to look out into the distance, please. I'm going to test the direct and consensual light reflexes. In the direct reflex, I shine the light in the right eye and the right pupil constricts. I shine the light in the left eye and the left pupil constricts. When testing the consensual light reflex, I shine the light in the right eye and the left pupil constricts. I shine the light in the left eye and the right pupil constricts. The fifth nerve the trigeminal has both sensory and motor components. Light touch sensation is tested in the ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular divisions. I'm now going to test the sensation on your face. I'd like you to tell me if it feels the same on each side. Corneal reflex involves afferent fibers from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and efferent for the facial nerve. If incorrectly I touch the insensitive sclera, no response occurs. When correctly I touch the cornea, a bilateral blink response is obtained. This test is uncomfortable. It can be omitted if sensory impairment is not suspected. The motor function of the trigeminal nerve is to innovate the muscles of mastication. I'm going to test your jaw muscles now, please. Can you clench your teeth tight? Keep clenching. I can feel the temporalis muscle contracting. And again, please. I can feel the masseter contracting. 
Can you open your jaw now, please? The pterygoid muscles open the jaw in the midline. Could you keep it open for me? The pterygoids are strong, and I should not be able to overcome this movement. Can you move your jaw from side to side? If the right pterygoid muscle is weak, the jaw will deviate to the right, and if the left is weak, it will deviate to the left. The facial nerve innervates the muscles of facial expression and buccinator. I'd like to test your facial muscles now. Could you raise your eyebrows fully, please? And we're looking for wrinkling of the forehead due to contraction of the frontalis muscle, and this should be symmetrical. Can you now screw your eyes tight together? We're testing the orbicularis oculi muscle, and I shouldn't be able to open the eyes. Thank you. Now, can you smile like this, please? And I'm looking for symmetry of the smile and equal action of the orbicularis aurus muscle. Now, can you blow out your cheeks? This is a function of the buccinator muscle. I press gently and see if there's any incontinence of air and escape of air from the mouth. Thank you. The eighth nerve, the vestibulocochlea, has auditory and balance functions. I'm going to test your hearing. I'm going to cover one ear and whisper a number in the other. Would you tell me what the number is, please? 36. Yeah. 43. Thank you. If I detect any hearing deficit, I would move on to the tuning fork tests. I'm going to do some tuning fork tests. This is a Weber's test. Can you hear that vibrating? Yes. Does it sound louder on one side or the other? It's the same on both sides. That's normal. I'm now going to do the Rene test. Can you hear that vibrating? Yes. Please will you tell me when it stops? I can't hear that. Can you hear that? Yep. That's a normal Rene test. I'd now go on to repeat the test on the opposite side. Both of these tests rely on the fact that normally air conduction is better than bone conduction. If the air passages are blocked, then air conduction will be reduced, and this is conduction deafness. If the auditory nerve is affected, then both modalities will be reduced, and this is sensory neural deafness. The bulbar nerves are conveniently examined together. Now I'm going to test your throat and mouth. First of all, could you give a loud cough, please? <coughs> okay. This tests the vagus nerve. Now I'm going to test for articulation, which involves coordination of tongue, teeth, and lips, and requires the facial, vagus, and hypoglossal nerves. Could you say the days of the week? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Thank you. What I'd like to do now is to examine the back of your throat. Could you open your mouth wide for me? Can you say ah? Ah. And again, please. Ah. The soft palate should move upwards centrally to protect the nasopharynx when the patient swallows. If there is palsy, the soft palate is pulled to the stronger side. The gag reflex is elicited by gently touching the posterior pharyngeal wall on each side and results in a gag response. It is uncomfortable and not usually tested in the conscious patient. It requires both cranial nerves 9 and 10 for afferent and efferent rolls, respectively. The twelfth nerve, the hypoglossal, innervates the motor supply to the tongue. I'm going to examine your tongue. Could you open your mouth for me? Could you protrude your tongue? Can you move it from side to side? Now can you push your tongue against my fingers? 
And can you do it on the other side, please? Thank you. The accessory nerve innervates the sternomastoid muscles and the upper fibres of the trapezius. I'm going to test your neck and shoulders. Could you shrug your shoulders for me, please? I'm looking for symmetrical elevation of the shoulders by the trapezius muscles here. Next, could I get you to turn your head against my hand? And I'm looking here at the sternomastoid muscle. If we could do it the other side, please. Could you turn your head against my hand again? And again, we're looking at the sternomastoid muscle here. Okay, that's all I need to examine. Thank you.